my second volume that I, that I wish to show you today is Rashi again um, and related uh, by an additional aspect of it. So this is the second edition of Adolf Berliner's work on Rashi. In, a, in the second and expanded edition printed in Frankfurt am Main in 1905, additionally printed in Krakow. And um, my edition is in the original boards. However, I recently, a friend of mine uh, who is a, a bookbinder added this new spine to it. The original spine had been severed. And uh, often when that happens, you can save the boards, but you cannot save the spine because the spine was made out of cheap leather and the, the leather warps, and you can't unwarp leather, um, especially of that grade. Maybe perhaps high grade leather you can. But my, my good friend put on a, a fresh spine, put faux bands, put gilt, and um, really gave me something very nice. This book was previously held by a known and famous book collector, famous among us book collectors, called Berthold Strauss, and, uh, or Baruch Strauss, and his stamp indicates he lived in London. And an earlier stamp, which is on the second title, the title that is only in German, is from the Free Organization for the Interests of Orthodox Judaism, uh, probably in Frankfurt, although it doesn't tell us where it was. Because of that, and because of my knowledge of Strauss and where he got his library, he was able to assemble a good number of books that had survived the, the Holocaust and the Nazi collections or looting of Jewish libraries. I surmise that this volume uh, either came to us through where most of Strauss's, what we would call Nazi looted books, came through the library of that was originally part of Simon Hurwitz's library. Simon Hurwitz was the editor of this volume, the Moxer Vitri, and um, either that or it was another Nazi looted volume that came through to Strauss. I'm going to talk about Nazi looted volumes in a later video because I have some collection material related to that, but I will say one thing is that among the, the Nazi looted volumes we have a good number of markings which indicate without doubt that something was looted or stolen from the Nazis by the Nazis and then repatriated. This is an item where it is probable, but I don't know that for a fact. However, um, with the knowledge uh, that it may be that is enough to give it relevance to the discussion of the Nazis looting Sepharim and holy, holy books or even secular books or Jewish owned items from before the war and uh, them surviving World War II either in Germany or Europe and um, being repatriated to Jewish owners after the war. Now, this volume of Rashi and this work by Dr. Berliner is something that is very special. Um, unlike the Machzor Vitri, the commentary of Rashi on the, the Chumash, on the Torah, is something that has gone, had gone through at this point, and certainly by now, hundreds and hundreds of, of printings in different volumes. Some of the volumes may have been dedicated to Rashi, may have been a Chumash with Rashi on the side, or may have been a Chumash with Rashi and then a good number of other commentaries. However, um, this is coming to us from a scholar who actually went back to the earliest manuscripts he could find and used critical, uh, critical work in producing um, what he surmised is, pro is one of the finest Rashi texts. Um, I have not personally seen the text of Rashi in, in a better uh, format than, or, or, or a better, more pure, um, more pure command than, than this volume. And I recommend those who want to seriously study Rashi should use this volume to study. 
Um, and one of the, some of the many things which which come to us is um, obviously the the cross references, different things that are being quoted or may, maybe appearing in different iterations. Um, those who know Rashi understand that Rashi may have had different texts of the Medrash um, or Midrash and. Rashi also um, had Midrashim that we don't have anymore, and as well as we have earlier texts of Midrashim that maybe Rashi didn't see that survived in manuscripts that come from the East, such as the Cairo Geniza. And um, the critical work done on this is very, very fine. And you see that in the cross, in the references to texts that we have and the differences analyzed in the texts that we have as we have them, the manuscript texts as they were, and Rashi as it is in our text. There is also what's called a uh, ta'ut sofer, which is a scribal error, which any text will be full of them, whether or not there are, there are two manuscripts or there are hundreds. Um, and the critical work done here is some of the best that I've seen. Um, it should be, I think that it should be minimized to say that Rashi quotes the Mechilta, Rashi quotes the Sifrei, simply because of the fact that um, Rashi's commentary is not coming to quote things, Rashi's commentary is coming to, sh to shed light on things, and for that reason it's a little less relevant whether he's quoting something or turning something into another text. But really, what is he coming to shed light on? Uh, a lot of people have talked about this, and I am not going to elaborate too long on that. There is also um, additional things that may or may not have been in the original Rashi that Berliner has put into brackets. Finally, there is his work at the end in which he tells us what uh, was added by Rashi's secretary, Rabbeinu Shemaya, and what was added by different uh, people around Rashi's school, and what may have been added by scribes as not the original. There is also a short work on what we call the La'azim, uh, which are the, the words in Old French that come through in Rashi, um, with which scholars use to learn Old French. They, they look in Rashi in an old Judeo-French text. Um, there was, later on, there was more work done on this, but this, this is integral, I think, for people to understand the, the text of Rashi on the Torah to see the French that he is trying to tell you and to uh, understand it. Now, to understand it using this, this tool, one needs to know German. But um, it is still very important to use, and I think that to one studying the Lazim will probably have a, a, a better understanding of Rashi than one skipping him. I'll end off on my volume of Rashi, just saying that living in this time with all of the editions of the Chumash that we have, it's hard for me to even think of uh, edition strictly of Rashi before this one that did that stopped at the early early editions in the, the incunabula period in the 15th century there may be one but I'm not thinking of it at the moment and the reason simply is because um, with the advent of the rabbinic Bible people began studying commentaries as they studied the text and it became almost like a corpus in your hand where you can hold five commentaries, maybe seven, maybe eight, depending on the edition of the rabbinic Bible. Um, however, there's something, there's something unique to be gained by studying it in an edition dedicated just to his commentary. That is, you, you begin to hear his voice. And you're no longer just seeing the entire uh, gamut of commentaries that are out there. You begin to hear his voice and you begin to see 
At what point is he bringing you something else to shed light on a, on a matter? At what point is he speaking from his own voice? And at what point is he combining things as if two disparate midrashim, maybe one from the Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer and the other one from the Sifrei, combining them to shed light on a matter? And that gives you an, a different appreciation of what we could say is the greatest commentary to be written on the Torah, um, although there are those who may disagree, but I believe it is the greatest commentary written on the Torah, and it is um, an additional perspective is to be gained by it, uh, an addition like this, which shows you strictly the text of Rashi from beginning to the end.